How's it going, everybody? In this video, we're going to go ahead and start discussing a, at a high level what remote storage is all about. Now, I'm going to be focusing specifically on iSCSI, but there's another option available to any type of storage environment known as Fiber Channel. And there's also another one called InfiniBand. We're not going to really dive into those two specifically. We're only going to focus mainly on iSCSI because it's what I have the ability of demoing in my lab environment. But I definitely think it's a good idea for myself included, I'm going to be reading up on both uh, Fiber Channel and InfiniBand because I do believe that they're both supported capabilities. I know Fiber Channel for sure is. InfiniBand, not 100% sure on uh, support inside of a VMware environment, but I'm going to read up on it because I am preparing for the new VC, uh, the current VCP exam. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and break down the remote storage capability. And so basically what it is that we're trying to accomplish is Let's take a couple of hosts. So we're gonna draw a host here. We're gonna draw a host here. And I'm going to draw a hard drive inside of this guy, right? And it's gonna be a circle with a line attached to it. And then we're gonna do the same thing here. Going to basically be representative of a hard drive. So HDD here and an HDD here. That could be a solid state drive as well, but it really doesn't make much of a difference. The idea is if I need to go and upload a ISO file, so that ISO file is stored here on some sort of media, whatever it might be, it could be a USB to thumb drive, it could be anything. Well, somehow I need to get that drive, that ISO into this hard drive and into this hard drive, right? But that's done on a per host basis because this hard drive here, this guy and this guy, they are not currently able to talk to one another. So there's no real way for them to share the information. This is referred to as directly attached storage. And typically speaking, when you install ESXi on a hard drive inside of a ESXi host, you're going to go in and use the VMFS file system. Now, in terms of how all this stuff works, if I create a VM here and a VM here, they could be able to connect to each other through a network connection of some type and be able to communicate, you know, this could be dot 10, this could be dot 20, and they should be able to communicate with each other over the communication that is enabled through the, the network, right? Everybody, most people get that concept. But the problem with this logic is that when you go to demo it and play with it, I can't move a file from here over to here very easily, right? There's really no way, this process does not work well. So I need to come up with some other scenario where we come up with this scenario where we will take into consideration some of the other capabilities. Let me back this train up just a little bit. If I have go, let me go ahead and clear off some of this right here, right? So we have directly attached storage, everybody understands that. The next one we're going to talk about is remote storage. Remote storage. And there's a few different types you have, and this is commonly referred to as a storage area network. There's another variation called a network attached storage. These are two different things. This is block level storage, right? Block level. This is file level. You might say, well, Rob, what's the difference? The main difference between the two is block level will appear to whoever is using that storage as a hard drive, where file level storage will look as if it's a remote file share. So whenever I pull up my network attached storage appliance, my QNAP file server, essentially, it is using the SMB protocol to communicate from my Windows 10 PC that I'm on recording to that file server. That's it, it's using SMB to go back and forth and there's there's gets, there's puts, there's retrievals, all that type of stuff. Where, and that's what NAS is, right? When we talk about SAN communication, we have a couple of different protocols that we can use. I will be talking about iSCSI in some level of detail. But that's the protocol that we will be using to allow our ESXi host, where eventually all six of them, 
to communicate back and forth with each other via storage. So when I say it's remote storage, it's also remote shared storage or RSS. Well, why is it referred to as that? Well, you create a storage appliance and on the storage appliance, you create, you take a very large hard drive capacity, like let's say, you know, one terabyte of storage. And I can take that and map that to what they refer to as a logical unit number or a LUN. A LUN is basically just a volume that you're going to serve up to your users of that storage capability. Now you can have multiple LUNs. You can have LUNs LUN 0, you can have LUN 1, you can have LUN, LUN 2, and they're all volumes, right? They're, di they're different hard drives that you can divvy up and give the host over here connectivity to it. Now, there's a couple different ways that you can provide that connectivity. The way we're going to be doing it is on VMware Workstation, we're going to use a different VM net. We're going to use VM net 2. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to add another NIC. So right now we have, uh, I'll, I'll put N here. We have N, NIC 1, which is going to be used for management. We have NIC 2, which is used for data. And then we have NIC 3, which will be used for storage area network connectivity. So I'll do the same thing here, NIC 1, NIC 2, and NIC 3. Again, uh, management, data, and storage. And what I will basically do is for this communication here, this will attach to the VM net of VM net 2. So this will be VM net 2. And then the storage appliance will also connect to VM net 2. What that's going to allow to happen is you will basically build yourself a little local area network, a LAN connection between these devices and you'll allocate a IP subnet. So for example, 10.1.2.0 slash 24. This will be dot 100. This will be dot uh, normally I use whatever uh, the normal IP address is. So if the management is 60, this will be dot 60. This will be, I'm sorry, this will be dot 61, for example, or 65 or whatever the IP, the ma management interface IP address is. I try to keep them the same across the board so it's easier to keep track of. And what they're gonna do is they're actually gonna use the protocol known as SCSI, Small Computer Systems Interface. And basically what it does is it allows the storage capability right here to be sent in back and forth through SCSI messages. SCSI messages allow the, the, the read, the write operations to happen on the remote storage and also for the hard drive to be basically presented to whoever needs to use it. So that means that I'll be able to create another hard drive here. So we'll create another hard drive here and another hard drive here, but it won't be physically on the host, right? It'll be divvied up from over here and you'll be using SCSI. Now SCSI is a connection, mecha uh, connection method, but when you throw the, uh, the letter I, specifically lowercase, it's basically internet SCSI. Now what does that mean? It simply means that you're using, you're taking SCSI messages, you're placing them behind an IP packet, and then using the IP network to provide that connectivity. And that's basically what's happening. So when I do this, as long as I have LAN connectivity, it doesn't matter what the actual encapsulation is, because when you go over to fiber channel, you're using fiber channel encapsulation. You need fiber channel network adapters, you need fiber channel switches. That's a whole other set of complexities that I don't have to deal with. I will be using strictly iSCSI because that's what I have to do in my lab. If you are working in a large or a much larger organization and you want to deal with fiber channel, you probably will, but keep in mind that when we're talking about Fiber Channel, Fiber Channel also does things differently. There's different speeds to go with it, 2, 4, 8, 16 gigs, etc., and it requires different network adapters. It requires different um, switch, it requires switches that actually support the Fiber Channel protocol and things like that. So, and there's layer three uh, Fiber Channel, there's layer two Fiber Channel, things like that. We're not going to get into any of that type of stuff. Um, we're going to be dealing strictly with IP based connectivity because that allows most people that already understand basic networking 
to very easily grasp the concept of iSCSI. Now, iSCSI, when you deploy it and you get it rolled out, you need to do a couple of things to your hosts. The first thing we need to do to our host is we're going to have to create another uh, vSphere standard switch. So a VSS needs to be created on each one of the hosts. And that new NIC, so that NIC3 will be mapped to this new VSS, right, on both, on both devices. And what you do is on here, you don't create a port group here because they're not trying to take a VM and place it into this vSwitch, right? We're not trying to do that. Well, instead what we do is we take advantage of the VM kernel adapter. This allows us to create a IP or um, an interface on the host that's going to allow us to leverage the storage. So when we go to configure it, we're basically going to tell it we want to pay attention to iSCSI communications, and we're going to we're going to tie the VM kernel to the uh, the vSphere standard switch or the VSS. And then when we do that, then we can go to the storage configuration and we can bind the iSCSI, actually I should say the iSCSI HBA or host bus adapter, the network adapter, to the NIC3. And that's going to allow us to bind or receive the incoming storage that's being delivered by the storage appliance, right? And that's basically how this process comes into play. It's really, that's really it. And the cool thing is, is I can start to add multiple hosts. So let's say, for instance, on the target, the iSCSI target, which is where the storage is actually handled, let's say I take and I allocate 750 gigabytes of storage. Okay, and I, that's one LUN. So basically it's one volume. When I take this and I have host one, host two, host three, and host four, for example, and they all join the VMNet2 subnet, they are going to come in and they're going to plug into the adapter of the iSCSI target will also be one of its NICs will be mapped to VMNet2. So this will be VMNet2. What will end up happening is this guy will be dot 10, this will be dot 20, for example, dot 30, and dot 40, this guy will be dot 100, hypothetically speaking here. And what's going to end up happening is this hard drive here that we've built with this 750 gig storage capacity will now show up over here as a hard drive and so on and so forth. But the thing is, is we will have that 750 gigs will be shared we just draw it this way here across the board. That 750 gigs will be shared across all of these hosts. Now, why that matters is because when I go to upload an ISO file, let's say I log into host one, and I take the uh, server 2012 R2, and I take the win Ten ISO and I upload them to this hard drive through one of the hosts, guess what? That also is now uploaded to here. So actually it, it, those ISOs exist over here. So server 2012 R2 here and then win 10 here. They exist actually right here. This is where they're written to. But now those same things, I'll just put S and W show up here as well. That means that as I'm doing this upload to the storage appliance, all of my other ESXi hosts also see that. So now I can go out and deploy a VM from that ISO file, and then the storage appliance will say, okay, well, I'll send you the ISO file for, so you can install uh, that VM onto your machine. And so now I can deploy multiple VMs across multiple hosts from a single ISO file that's being shared from the iSCSI target. That is how this all works. That's why remote storage is so much more effective than local storage. So 
when we get into vCenter and some follow-on videos, you'll see what that looks like when we start to scale this out and we move away from the virtual standard switch to the virtual distributed switch and all that type of stuff. And we get into some more hardcore networking and stuff like that. There's gonna be a lot of really cool stuff that we have to deal with in terms of the operations. But at the end of the day, the process we're trying to accomplish is making sure that we know how all this stuff works. That's why I needed to give you guys kind of a, hey, this is this, this is uh, using locally attached storage. There's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes you actually will do that locally so that your VM, some VMs will be more read intensive, more write intensive, things like that. And you'll use a much higher throughput IOP configuration through like SSDs or some like, something like that that's quicker to read than your typical iSCSI communication. So that's basically storage. That's the high level details to it. Um, there's more to it than that, obviously, and I'll walk you through some of those steps, but I wanted to help you understand the high level architecture of how that comes into play because that's really important when we get further along and we start to scale this out. Because things like vMotion and storage vMotion and distributed resource scheduler and clusters and vSAN, all those advanced high availability and capabilities that are available in vCenter are not possible unless you do remote storage. So that's why I'm bringing it up now. You know, it's, it's cool to deploy a couple of VMs through local storage, but when you upload your ISOs to a file share, or I'm sorry, like a iSCSI target, and then you deploy from there, you can deploy multiple hosts from a single ISO file that's located on some sort of shared storage. So with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna go ahead and kill it there. Um, we will move on to actually deploying this in the next video. I will go through and get all of the configurations done for, I'll deploy the storage appliance. We'll go in and get the networking all set up and all that type of stuff in some follow-on videos. Until next time, guys, thanks so much for stopping by and we'll catch you guys in the next video.